Mark, thank you very much for this uh, generous uh, introduction and for inviting me here. Is the microphone working? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, to address such a distinguished, distinguished group of people, especially on a, such a topical subject as art and music as uh, vehicles of uh, breaking cross-cultural barriers. I am particularly delighted to, be, uh, to address this topic in Berlin uh, because this was actually the first city uh, in which I crossed my first cross-cultural barrier in 1988. Mm. Uh, in 1988, which was before the Berlin was, was down, I was traveling on my very first foreign uh, trip abroad from Soviet Russia. So I'm joining the camp of uh, those uh, Soviet survivors whom we heard already today. And I was going <coughs> to Paris, where I'm coming from now, on my very first trip 22 years ago. So I'm very <laughs> delighted uh, to come here today, 22 years later, to speak in this city about the very subject which was at core uh, during my very first trip across the Berlin <coughs> Wall. Uh, as I was listening to the previous speakers, uh, I felt uh, some kind of split personality because on one hand I'm here as an international civil servant to represent UNESCO, which is I am doing with a great pleasure. It's my honor to represent uh, the organization I'm working for. On the other hand, I'm also coming here uh, with shared memories that some of the previous speakers expressed in the audience. Uh, at, at the same time, I also, I'm also coming from Egypt, so uh, some of the Egyptian events reflected on my personality. So at the end of the day, I really don't know which kind of positions should I be talking about. And I think this reflects on many of us in the audience. All of you today here have some kind of split personalities. Because all of you are from some other country, you're experiencing Berlin, you're experiencing different speakers in front of you in the room. So I will try to manage all these personalities in today's talk and I'll try to see if we can actually distill some of the UNESCO speech from the professorship speech, let's say. <coughs> One of them is PowerPoint. A professor cannot do without a PowerPoint, at least if it's a business pro professor. And then uh, maybe at the end I can reflect on some of the so Soviet things that uh, uh, resonated with me during the previous speaker's lecture. So let's start with the UNESCO part. And um, uh, since its creation, UNESCO has been at the forefront of creating the conditions for dialogue among cultures and people based upon commonly shared values. To quote from our charter, since the wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defenses of peace must be constructed. It is this sentiment that embodies the core values of the organization. From the International Year of Rapprochement of Cultures and International Cultural Conventions to the Cultural Roots for Development and Dialogue and Cultural Tourism, UNESCO, through its many programs, conventions, and organizations, is meeting the challenge of promoting and preserving cultural diversity and fostering the dialogue between cultures. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I will first remind you uh, about the key uh, facts regarding UNESCO. And then I'll specifically address the issue of culture, intercultural dialogue, and cultural expression. So let's start with UNESCO. And uh, uh, in a little discussion we had over lunch with Gary, who's not in the room. No. And uh, uh, he asked me a question. And uh, this question struck me. I said, what is a UNESCO? That's a very good question because I think that there is a very little understanding outside of organization itself uh, in the general public of what UNESCO does, what it stands for, why is it there, what is the mission, and how it's actually useful to anybody. So uh, the first slide here you see in front of you is a uh, few facts about UNESCO. First of all, somebody said that UNESCO is the brain of the United Nations. And um, I, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'll just ask if there is anybody in the room who is not sure which one of the letters in abbreviation stands for. So the question is, it's an interactive session, right? The question is, is there anybody who is not sure? There are five or six letters in the name. Is there somebody who is not sure what some of the letters stands for? Nobody? At least a few people, right? So. Uh, this is why I'm here, thank you. <laughs> thank you for raising your hands because this is why I'm here to tell you 
what is it for? I actually changed this presentation from it was, it had the whole name, and then I took it off, and I put the abbreviation just to check. Uh, and uh, UNESCO stands for United Nations uh, Educational Science and Cultural Organization, and this is uh, generally understood that this is the brain of United Nations. This is where all the scholarly specialists in different areas of education, sciences, and communications uh, unite and try to create policies for a better world. It was established in 1945, and uh, right now it has 193 member states, which is pretty much all member states in the world, almost all. Um, and um, the mission of UNESCO is exactly the development of culture of peace and eradication of poverty, sustainable development, and again, intercultural dialogue. So I can see that uh, Mark had it right uh, in terms of inviting us for this conference because this is exactly in our mission, to contribute towards intercultural di dialogue, to use culture as a vector uh, of uh, peace. So I'm very pleased that I have this opportunity to talk to all of you, especially the young people in the audience, and to talk about the organization I'm proud to be associated with. Here's the UNESCO structure. The lady on the right is the first female director general in organization since 1945. Uh, this is uh, our Director General Irina Bokova from Bulgaria. Uh, UNESCO has five sectors, uh, educational sector, natural sciences, social and human sciences, culture sector, sec uh, sector of communication and information. And in each uh, sector, there are specialists, uh, specialists who are experts in, this a in these areas uh, of uh, organization. So uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the culture. So we heard a lot about culture from distinguished speakers before me. I'm not going to argue which definition is best. Everybody has uh, his or her own definition. So what exactly is the culture? Uh, UNESCO, in fact, defined culture, and it's the only organization in the United Nations uh, uh, system that has the word culture in its charter. And um, UNESCO Universal De Declaration on Cultural Diversity 2001 defines culture as uh, it says, culture should be regarded as a set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features of society or social group, and that it encompasses in addition to art and literature, lifestyles, ways of living together, value system, traditions, and belief. So this is a very long definition. And um, let's put it more simply, and maybe it can foreshadow a little bit, uh, some discussions we're going to have uh, tomorrow and also the music we're going to listen tonight. Uh, maybe more simply put, it can be said as inscribed by anonymous uh, hand above the door of the Kabul Museum in Afghanistan, a nation is, is alive when its culture is alive. So this is maybe a better way of talking about culture. So I'm here today to speak to you as a managing director of the culture sector and World Heritage Center. Uh, what it means is I'm in charge of making the center work efficient. I'm not in charge, of, in charge of the programs, but I'm just making sure that all this huge brain uh, works well and well fed in the sense it makes efficient, it delivers the goals. Uh, let's talk about the culture sector. So the culture sector has its own mission and uh, the two parts of the mission, first one is promotion of cultural diversity through protection, conservation, and preservation of cultural and natural heritage, and uh, support creativity and promotion of cultural diversity, and second, promotion of so social integration. Uh, this is done through encouragement of diversity, intercultural dialogue, and culture of peace, by reaffirming the central ro role of culture for sustainable development. And again, uh, the, thing, uh, the tools that we use to achieve this uh, mission is a set of conventions developed by the member states, signed and developed. Uh, what is a convention? Convention is a legal instrument that a group of countries <coughs> decide to sign together and implement in their countries, respective countries. So uh, we have a, a set of such conventions, and uh, I'll just uh, name to you some of the conventions, and you will see as I'll go through them that some of, the, uh, of them have more members and some others have less members. So you will see that some, some countries decide to sign this convention, that means they decide to promote the mission that I just presented to you, but some others don't. 
we have uh, three main conventions and some others. So the main ones are the cultural and natural world heritage, which was signed exactly 40 years ago next year. And we're gonna have a huge celebration of 40 years anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. Then, uh, so in this convention, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but uh, for now I'll just name a few. Intangible cu uh, cultural heritage, signed in 2003, just uh, eight years ago. And finally, our last one, diversity of cultural expressions, which is signed in 2005. So these are the conventions that are signed by some governments, and then we, as UNESCO, implement these conventions, help the governments to promote these conventions in their countries, and I'll tell you how. Uh, plus, we also have intersectorial programs. It means the programs that touch different uh, sectors, uh, different um, people di working in different sectors of their uh, cultural program, such as cities, we have historical cities, uh, such as museums, uh, promotion of the museums, working together, sustainable tourism, not just tourism, but sustainable tourism and cultural tourism, and finally, <laughs> heritage and dialogue. So, uh, as you can see, our work is very heavy in terms of content, but it's also very large in terms, in terms of outreach. Let's start with the first convention, and here you'll see on the, on the slide, I show you what I'm talking about on, on the left-hand side. You see the sign that I'm talking now about the very first convention that was presented. Uh, Cultural and Natural World Heritage Convention, so-called World Heritage Center. This is where I, I actually work originally. Uh, talks or preserves the monuments, landscape, and natural sites of outstanding universal value. What is outstanding universal value? Outstanding universal value is something which is important for us to keep for the future generations that the government pledged to protect and the government actually come to us and say we want to uh, establish this or that site as a World Heritage Site. How many of you have heard of the World Heritage Center? A few? Fifty <coughs> percent? Yeah, no, more, I think sixty percent. And how many of you have been to the World Heritage Center's website? No? Ten? No, maybe fifteen percent, something? No, less, maybe ten percent. So I would like to encourage all of you uh, who are in the field of uh, cultural diplomacy, go and check uh, the World Heritage uh, site. And it has a very interesting interactive map where you can click and see what sites in each country are uh, inscribed, see the pictures, testimonials, and things like that. So you'll know at least in your own country, or in your present country, if you have multiple countries, uh, you will see which sites or which are uh, the heritage um, that you have. And also when you visit, uh, in other countries, you can see which other sites you can see in those countries. So, the mission of the World Heritage Center is to, first of all, first and foremost, to provide emergency assistance to the sites in danger. Because as we all know, there are several sites in danger, such as the recent example was the Pompeii, uh, was, uh, there was a collapse in Pompeii, uh, the previous one uh, was in Bam, in Iran, there was an earthquake. So. Our job is to provide emergency assistance, financial and technical. It's also to provide technical assistance and professional training to the member states to help them to develop, uh, the, peop develop the people who can actually, experts who can go and maintain and conserve the World Heritage Sites. But uh, also, not less important, is to raise awareness about the sites. As we can see, even in this distinguished group of people, uh, arguably very much in tune with international development. We, not everybody knows about the World Heritage Center and this is my job to actually make it known. So hopefully by the end of today, some of you will go and check out the websites and uh, uh, then I'll feel accomplished. And uh, finally, we want to encourage international cooperation in the area of uh, heritage conservation. And um, just a few facts. It was adopted in 72, as I said. As you can see, how many, uh, in UNESCO, how many member states did I say it? They were? 193. So you can see, not all member states signed this convention. It means, and you will see with other conventions, it's even fewer number. So as you can see, that not everybody is actually agreeing and, um, to do what we want to do. So uh, 911 sites inscribed in the World Heritage, the Heritage List. It's a lot of sites. So you can imagine that uh, 
uh, in, uh, but some of the countries which signed the convention still don't have any sites in Prague. So this is another challenge. We're talking about that some of them probably are not ready to pro produce the documents that they have to ensure the security of this site and the governments have to support the maintenance of this site as a heritage site. It means they cannot build a modern building or something ugly or nuclear plant near the World Heritage Site. It's a big commitment from the government. And uh, we had some issues, for example, in France, where there was a nuclear uh, plant near a particular site, and we had to exclude this location from the World Heritage uh, consideration. So again, it's a big commitment from the government side, and I think it's for the best because we want to keep our heritage clean and preserved for the future generations. And um, so cultural heritage is uh, more than people's memory of a living culture. It takes many different forms. Uh, uh, from uh, both tangible monument landscape, uh, museum objects, and intangible languages, know-how, performing art, music, cultural expression, all of which represent artistic expression in one form or the other. At its core, heritage is an instrument of a two-way process between the past, present, and the future. Linked to memory, heritage embodies values and cultural identities. It enables us to understand ourselves and others. Uh, since the dawn of time, uh, heritage has contributed to an uninterrupted dialogue between civilizations and cultures and made significant contribution to establishing and maintaining the peace between people. Uh, so uh, we looked already at the natural and cultural heritage. Let's talk about the intangible heritage convention. Intangible heritage is the cultural practices and expressions transmitted from generation to generation, not necessarily those practices which are very old and uh, uh, maybe lost. But also the modern practices such as graffitis may be considered intangible heritage. Uh, in the discussion we had over lunch with Gary again, we were talking about jazz and he was wondering uh, whether jazz was on the list of intangible heritage because some other music traditions and uh, performing traditions such as Sufi dance is inscribed in the intangible heritage list as well as, uh, for example, French cuisine uh, is inscribed as a, into the Intangible Heritage Convention. So uh, if you can see the key facts on this slide, you see 133 member states signing this convention. And uh, to answer Gary's question, what about jazz? Where is the birthplace of jazz? U.S. U.S. didn't sign the convention? Uh-oh. So everything which is in the U.S., including jazz, and everything else which can be subscribed is not. So this is one of the, one of the issues we have, that this is a very bureaucratic process. I personally think that uh, there are a lot of more than 232 elements that can be inscribed. And uh, what do you think? Will it be more intangible heritage in the world than tangible? I would think so. So this, uh, but on the other hand, this convention was uh, uh, only signed in 2003, so we should give it another 30 years to develop and hopefully we'll have much more than just 233 elements. And you can encourage your governments to sign this convention, uh, hopefully, especially those from the United States. And uh, the mission, again, is protect intangible cultural heritage respect the custodian of such heritage, specifically communities, groups, and individuals, and raise awareness about intangible cultural her heritage through cooperation and assistance. So we're not talking specifically about the old tradition, but also modern tradition. Uh, now the next one is the cultural diversity. Let me talk about it first. Um, now in terms of cultural diversity, this can be best explained as a source of exchange, innovation, and creativity. Cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. It is the reason why in our increasingly complex and mobile societies, cultural diversity is recognized as basic ingredient for harmonious interaction among people, which enables us to live together. Our respect and appreciation for cultural diversity hinges on our capacity to be surprised and marvel at others. The conundrum that we now face is how can artistic expression that forms the core of culture and heritage help us cross cultural barriers? 
The starting point, I believe, lies in embracing a fundamental truth. Understanding worldwide cultural diversity cannot happen until we understand the diversity inherent in one's own culture. For example, how do we react to the perception that cultural uniformity is a problem uh, that is being exacerbated by a very rapid pace of globalization, when in fact globalization actually may create the condition for a new dialogue among cultures and civilizations through the internet, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, mobile technology, and increased international tourism. So our third convention, you see I'm coming to the end with conventions, so this is our third convention, is uh, for promotion of cultural expressions and cultural diversity. Cultural expressions are defined as manifestations of human creativity through activities, cultural goods and services, and support of the modern culture. Uh, the mission of the convention is promotion of the cultural policy and creativity and recognition of the contribution of the cultural industry uh, to economic and social development. How many times do we hear that uh, the creative people, culture people always need uh, funding from outside sources? Actually, we fail to recognize the potential, which is, uh, as Aristotle would say, should just become actuality, potentiality becoming actuality. This is what we need for our, uh, for our creative industry. So integration of culture uh, in the strategies of stra uh, sustainable development and national policies and promotion of international cooperation. So it's uh, the most recent convention adopted in 2005. Even fewer in members. So as you can see, just over 50% of the states in the world uh, that are member states. And at this point, um, they are not having any list. Uh, they're just conducting different projects in this particular area. So they have 31 projects funded in developing countries to promote uh, cultural expressions and cultural diversity. So finally, uh, the uh, uh, programs, the thematic programs, one of these 31 uh, programs, we have something such as projects and partnerships, such as International Fund for Cultural Diversity and Global Alliance for Cultural Diversity. Uh, in terms of activities, uh, UNESCO conducts several capacity building activities such as technical assistance in, the, in building cultural policies on the national level, knowledge exchange between different countries, transparency of implementation, education and awareness raising, and uh, as well, UNESCO particip encourage participation uh, in civil society uh, in terms of uh, creative industries. So we are coming to the last uh, topic of uh, today's discussion, which is a dialogue, intercultural dialogue. And uh, this is why we're all here today, to have a dialogue even if we have three interlocutors. So as I mentioned before, uh, dialogue uh, is actually part of the third convention, but I believe it deserves uh, its own discussion. Now I can turn, switch off a little bit my UNESCO hat and put on the professor hat because I studied a lot of psychology and um, I just want to share with you some of the thoughts from the studies. When you want to foster a dialogue, it's very important that you have to listen to your interlocutor. You have to listen to the other. Not only to listen, but also to hear the other. The research has found that 75% of oral communication is either misheard, misunderstood, misinterpreted, or simply forgotten. So whatever you hear today, you, at the best, you will retain 25%. This is if you have very good memory and still young. So hopefully you'll try to take notes and maybe get back to them or take notes, never get back to them, but you'll still remember more than if you just listen. So uh, you need to develop act active listening skills. What does it mean, active listening skills? It means that when you try to understand the other person with whom you have a dialogue, you have to actually put away some of your prejudice and stereotypes, have the split personality. So split personality is good because you actually, for a moment, you are trying to foster your active listening skills. You are trying to put yourself, if you can, in the shoes of, uh, of the other person. And um, I want to make a little parenthesis here, a bracket, and recall a film, very interesting film talking about Egypt. Here is my Egypt coming in. 
Uh, talking about Egypt, there was a very interesting and amazing film that was made a uh, few years ago, which is called Hassan and Marcus. Which, uh, the film was about um, Amar Sharif, a famous uh, actor, is playing uh, one of the, uh, I think he's playing uh, Hassan, and uh, Imam Adel, uh, Adel Imam is playing uh, uh, the other character. So one of them is uh, uh, Muslim Imam, another one is of course Christian Coptic. Uh, uh, priest, both of them are in trouble <coughs> because uh, each of them is fooled by their Muslim brothers or Christian brothers to participate in some kind of extremist activities which they don't want to do. So since they don't want to do it, they're being attacked by this extremist, uh, damaged or almost killed. So the good Egyptian government, the civil military government, decides to protect these two people and creates a, you know, like a protection program like in the US, so creates a protection program for them. And uh, what's the best way to protect a Muslim is to make him a Christian. So they create a new ID card for a Muslim imam where he becomes Christian and the Christian becomes Muslim and they send them very, very, very far away from Cairo. The problem is they send them to the same place. <laughs> and uh, as the chance find it, they end up believing in the same building across each other, and they start actually while pretending being Christian or the other, they actually discovering that the other and themselves are not very different. So at the end, it's a very moving uh, film. It talks about how you discover the religion of the other by actually becoming him or her. And um, if you have a chance to see this movie, I would uh, strongly encourage, and of course, great artists, uh, great actors, and a uh, very interesting movie. I'm surprised actually it was allowed in Egypt, uh, but uh, it's had a lot of success. It's very recent, a couple of years ago. And um, uh, it's after watching this movie, I gave my students in the business ethics class a project to go and uh, write a paper or an essay on discrimination of the other. Because Christians in Egypt is a very big uh, minority, it's about 10%. So among the students, it's about 30% of students are Christian. So I actually send them to write an essay how uh, Muslims are discriminated somewhere. And then I send Muslims to write how Christians are discriminated. So this was a very interesting activity. So, um, so on one hand, you need to listen and to hear the other. On the other hand, you need to clearly articulate your thoughts. The idea is that when you articulate your thoughts, they become clearer for yourself. Carl Weick said, I don't know what I think until I see what I say. Again. I don't know what I think until I see what I say. So it means that actually while your thoughts are still in your brain, they are not very much clear because they are presented as concepts, not as verbs and nouns. So the moment you articulate your thoughts, you can understand better yourself. So on one hand, um, you listen to understand the other. On the other hand, you break, you speak to understand yourself. So as a result, you come to a dialogue with the other, but most importantly, this dialogue should start with dialogue with yourself. And this is where I come back, where I started, to where I started about the split personality. So how did I go from being an oppressed Soviet teenager or not that teenager. So I lived in Soviet Union until I was 25. So how did I come from being a 25 years old oppressed Soviet person to an international civil servant at UNESCO at a high level? So the question I think comes to being aware of what you are and having a continuous dialogue with yourself to increase self-awareness and to understand why you are like you are and how to make yourself better, and especially to understand the other. Because you have to have this curiosity for the other. Why they are not like me, <coughs> without judging. This is very important. So, uh, to conclude the dialogue discussion, as I mentioned before, building the peace and minds of men and women is UNESCO's ultimate goal. Genuine dialogue, and more specifically enabling intercultural dialogue, uh, is essential if we are to achieve this goal and to fulfill our mandate. The aim is not to impose dialogue, but to invite the parties of conflict to participate voluntarily. Dialogue must be uh, premised on respect and mutual recognition. Dialogue must go beyond a mere attitude of tolerance to the other cultures. If proactively engaged, 
initiatives towards appreciating differences. At an international conference for dialogue and civilization held in Tokyo in July 2001, participants discussed the definition of dialogue. One thing that this conference yielded was the understanding that we need not to be threatened by otherness. If we just discard the prejudice and stereotypes and go forward with the dialogue. In such context, otherness and diversity are in fact the source of a richer world. The appreciation of the cultural expressions belonging to the cultures of the other lead, leads to the removal of negative Im images of our neighbors as well as incitement of hatred and violence. The beauty is that the diversity of cultural expressions and heritage values create the conditions of a fruitful dialogue. And preserving uniqueness, diversity of cultures, cultural expressions, heritage values form the key part of the dialogue between the cultures. Cultures confront, confront themselves in terms of values, enriching each other through a process of give and take that is an incentive to creativity. Culture, cultural expressions have a role in stimulating the societies, making them move and change. We will hear more about the wonderful examples of cultural expressions such as music, paintings, and in later sessions. And uh, today, just to conclude, after I've seen all our presentations, I just want to mention uh, something else uh, which I uh, participated in. It was in the United States, um, uh, Mark mentioned I was on the board of directors of the Levantine Cultural Center, which was a society or association, NGO, created by um, several American producers of Middle Eastern and uh, Middle Eastern origin, or generally Eastern origin. What they were doing, and it's very interesting because it was creating something more valuable than just simple presentations. Uh, as you know, Los Angeles, it has a lot of communities to a degree that they have sub sub different quarters. For example, you can drive around and see a little Armenia, or you can go and uh, see Chinatown. So communities are there. It's very multicultural. The problem is they don't communicate. They only go to their own events and uh, they completely ignore 25 other communities that live next door. And uh, although they don't have animosity, but they ignore them. So what did the Levantine Center did? And again, I suggest you to go on their website, levantinecenter.org. Uh, they created a series of concert, concerts and events whereby they would bring artists from one community, one artist from one community, and they would play near some music. So they would have uh, one Jewish violin player, they will have a Greek name player, uh, they will have uh, an Iranian tabla player. So all of them out, of course, and all of them will come together, bringing with them all of their communities. So suddenly, in a concert which only would attract, let's say, uh, 100 people, they would have 500 because each of the artists would bring with him or her uh, his own community. So when the community got together, they start to interact with each other. They have uh, afterwards cocktail sessions and other events. They subscribe to the website and they come to other events where there are discussions. So it's an interactive um, activity which continues until today. And I think it's uh, much more interesting than just uh, put it together uh, without a future interaction. So you need not only talking about the passive and active tools, so it actually goes more way beyond active. It's so proactive because it actually uh, throws people together and tells them to be almost in the shoes of this uh, movie characters where they exchange positions. They live in the same city. You can argue they're not that uh, much of their national representative, but still they carry with them their own values. So uh, to conclude the speech that while this may create, um, these tensions may create positive emotion violence, that may have consequences on social, cultural, and political landscapes. They are precisely the same values and ideals that are needed to help dissipate any confusion stemming from ignorance, prejudice, and exclusion that create tension, insecurity, violence, and conflict. Our task will be to foster respect for each other's cultures and break down the barriers between different cultures. Exchange and dialogue are the best tools for building peace. Thank you very much.